While you can watch this video on YouTube, most people in Manipur cannot access it. The state is suffering the second longest internet shutdown in India and India also holds the statistic for being the world leader, for being number one in terms of the number of internet shutdowns which are imposed across the country. The situation in Manipur is representative of how internet shutdowns are becoming more frequent, they're becoming longer and without any kind of accountability or legal check, they are being imposed rampantly across this country. Welcome to Amal Task Talks. Through this video, I will be taking you through how the internet shutdown has been imposed in Manipur, the stated official justifications for it, contrasting it against expert evidence, studies and the impact it's had on the people there. Finally, I will also be coming to how the governance institutional mechanisms are failing to fasten any kind of responsibility on the state government. Manipur has been burning since May 3rd, 2023, which is also the date when the first internet shutdown was imposed. However, there was a large sense of national apathy till July 19, when a video clip of sexual violence by a mob surfaced and went viral on social media. It even prompted the Prime Minister to break his silence after 78 days and comment on the shameful instance. During this period, an internet shutdown was continuing in this northeast state. What was the propriety of this internet shutdown? What were its status justifications? And what role did it play more importantly in the national apathy and obscuring visibility into the violence, into the deprivation which was ongoing in Manipur? To understand how internet shutdowns impact people, we first have to see how the people use the internet. Data from the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India shows that people of Manipur access the internet primarily through their smartphones and wired internet users, like the rest of India, constitute institutional, commercial and higher socio-economic groups. For instance, it may be an educational institution, a college, it may be a government office or it may be a person who may be accessing this on a desktop as opposed to a smartphone. Now, this is born from data in which a total pie of 0.05 million wireline users and 2.36 million wireless users are there in Manipur. Out of this, only 2.2 million connect to the internet. Hence, any internet shutdown on mobile-based internet access is going to deprive large sections of society. In fact, a majority of the users will not be able to access the internet. Now, the internet shutdown in Manipur was first imposed in some total both on wireless as well as on wireline modes. And also in terms of its geographic reach, was imposed on all 16 districts. It covered all kinds of web traffic and mediums of connectivity. Now, this blanket prohibition was imposed by a big order issued by the Commissioner of Home in Manipur under the Telecom Suspension Rules, which have been made under the Telegraph Act. These orders essentially are cyclostyle copies and extend the internet shutdown at every week or every four to five days. And they essentially contain a gist of reasons without any specificity. They state, and I quote, it is to thwart the design and activities of anti-national, anti-social elements by stopping the spread of disinformation and false rumors through various social media platforms. Now, these reasons may seem very reasonable to a lot of people. People may actually expect that the internet may contribute to spread of disinformation in the sense that something bad happened to a member of their community. It may lead to acts of violence with people getting excited. But let us first look at the evidence. Does the internet actually contribute to violence? And here there is an absence of data or specific instances of violence firstly in the orders themselves. The orders are completely silent. They do not mention any specific particulars of any inputs from the police departments or how specific instances were prevented. There's the absence of data, places, persons, groups. There is no specificity whatsoever in these orders. You may ask, well, Abad, that's a very high burden to place on the state. And of course, the state is trying to prevent incidents rather than document what actually happened. But this is not born from what has actually happened in Manipur. There has been a loss of life. There has been arson. There are people in relief camps. Now, given that their order is only valid for, let's say, about five days to a week, when it is renewed and the weekly deadline passes, a fresh order is passed. And that order, as well as I just stated, is a mere reproduction of the earlier one with only minor changes in dates, thus making it clear that these orders are, in fact, indefinite. One may wonder what is the compliance by the state government with the Supreme Court's judgment on internet shutdowns in Anuradha Basin versus Union of India, which said that internet shutdowns cannot be indefinite. But this is one way through renewals without any reason state government can perpetuate indefinite shutdowns and thereby not in procedure, but in spirit violate the Anuradha Basin judgment. Now you may also be wondering what is actually happening in the courts. Has anybody challenged these orders? Now, 
given their deep injury, people have indeed approached the High Court. And around 19th May, there were a batch of petitions filed in the High Court of Manipur. This case is vital to understand what has been the judicial response to the internet shutdown in Manipur and why the state government feels free to fiddle with the internet in the state. Now the case, despite extensive hearings, by advocates has not conducted any judicial review to the challenged orders which have directed the internet shutoffs. These are the orders I just read out, which I said were vague, did not have any specific reasons, and the court has not looked at them. So what has the court done if it has not done judicial review, if it has not examined those orders? It has instead looked at limited internet shutdowns being in place in Manipur. Now the primary objective as framed by the High Court has been in courts whether it is possible to provide limited usage of internet service to the public, end of quote. This is constitutionally incongruent to judicial review, for it avoids determining the legality of the impugned order, why the people came to court. However, this follows an institutional grammar on internet shutdowns, which has been set by the Apex Court, which comes from the top. Because in the case of Anuradha Basim versus Union of India, the Supreme Court also failed to adjudicate even one internet shutdown order which had been challenged by the petitioners for the shutdown in Jammu and Kashmir. The decision in Anuradha Basi did not also result in the restoration of access. Instead, the court directed the state authorities to review own orders suspending internet services. In effect, the court said, we cannot decide, the government itself will decide. Its directions were transparency, which is when the court said, that please publish these orders, please constitute these review committees, have also not been met, as illustrated in a joint report by Human Rights Watch and Internet Freedom Foundation. Bringing lasting damage, this case carved out greater flexibility for limited internet shutdowns, with the possibility of access in courts, government websites, localized limited e-banking facilities, hospital services and other essential services in those regions wherein the internet services are not likely to be restored immediately. End of quote. I will deal with the doctrine of limited internet shutdowns a little separately and would just like to focus on what the High Court actually did. The High Court directed the limited provision of wired line internet access, which as I said, is only used by a minority of the users and that too in higher socio-economic groups or by institutions. It continued the prohibition under the internet shutdown order for mobile-based users, which means that most people in Manipur could not still access the internet, even when we say it was incrementally restored around July 7th. Now, it directs the provisional access of leased line, primarily used by public departments and corporate offices, wired line services, with signed undertakings, a ban on social media, virtual private networks or VPN, as well as physical monitoring. So, it means that government institutions start getting access Educational institutions, corporate offices do get access, but they have to give signed undertakings and also subject themselves to physical verification that they're not using it for social media or for VPNs. And finally, the High Court says that it will constitute a technical committee which will look at how whitelisted specific mobile phones or smartphone numbers will get access to mobile internet. And this will be done by the home department of the state to which people will go and make applications and say that we want to access mobile-based internet. Please allow us to do that. Now, there are no clear definitions when the court says that what will be prohibited even on wildlife services or on mobile handsets if they're whitelisted, such as what is social media, which I constitute social media, or examining the continuing prohibition for internet usage primarily through smartphones. The court is not concerned with these things. It is also not looking at defining a process how the home department will accept or reject applications. Now, for these reasons, the internet shutdown continued in Manipur for close to 152 days. It was restored, but then again, the internet shutdown came back. The response of the Supreme Court also has been of judicial avoidance, matching what it did in Anuradha Basin. The top court had an opportunity to adjudicate this thrice. First, when a petitioner specifically approached it challenging the internet shutdown orders, and the court directed that petitioner to approach the High Court. Second, when the state government itself appealed the order for conditional restoration, which was directed by the High Court. And the state government came to the Supreme Court said that we cannot restore the internet in a conditional or an incremental manner. And finally, the Supreme Court is indeed hearing a wider, broader issue of communal violence, of ethnic violence, which is taking place in Manipur today. And in this case, internet shutdowns feature as an inherent element. For instance, the state government in its status report dated July 10th, before the Supreme Court has cited internet suspensions as a security measure in a separate paragraph. Also, the chief minister, when the viral video came out of those two cookie women 
which caused national outrage and for the first time focused national press attention as well as broader mass consciousness around the incidents in Manipur. The chief minister states on July 20th in a media interview that there are hundreds of similar cases. And that is the reason why the internet has been shut off in the state. Imagine the internet has been shut off so we do not get to know what is happening in Manipur. In fact, the state government loses an opportunity to put out accurate and authentic information thereby inspiring citizen trust, appealing for calm, saying where are the relief camps, what efforts it is taking to restore law and order. On the contrary, when the internet shutdown is in place, citizens engage on the basis of misinformation and serious consequences and further fracture of trust between communities, between neighbors, between different people. For instance, let's just take this instance itself. There is a press report dated June 1st, published on the online news portal NewsClick, which points out in chilling detail that disinformation served as the pretext for the perpetration of sexual violence against those cookies or women. For Manipur, the video clip was a vital moment for a national awakening that must be achieved without any reputational or social harm to survivors of sexual violence and communal hatred. At the same time, these information flows are necessary through reported accounts as done on that news report at NewsClick. Further, accountability can only come when the courts also start acting, we've seen both the Supreme Court and the High Court be completely deferential to the imposition of the internet shutdown by the state government. The question ordinary Indians need to ask themselves is that, what is the justification for the internet shutdown in its contribution to our apathy? Has it contributed to it because we did not get to know things soon enough about Manipur? We will never have these answers till we hear from the people in Manipur. Now, the second part of this video deals with the emerging doctrine of limited internet shutdowns which is a dangerous development arising from what has happened in Manipur as well as the internet shutdowns which are being imposed in different parts of the country today. Quite often, arguments are made to take away our fundamental rights under the promise that they will offer us security and safety, which brings us to the question that can we shut down the internet in a way that helps restore law and order but also permits beneficial use. In 2018, India attained the top global rank and has since retained the bold position for the highest number of internet shutdowns. Being a world leader in this authoritarian practice has brought not only shame to Indians, but has also caused deep and certain injury, economic, social, political, and civil. There is also concern about the growing periods of deprivation in which internet shutdowns are being imposed. Not too long ago, there was a mobile data blackout in Jammu and Kashmir for 552 days, which finally ended on February 4th, 2021. It has led to an administrative consensus for a middle ground around what is called as limited internet shutdowns. This idea holds a seductive appeal for officials in the Department of Telecom, legislators in the Standing Committee of IT, judges in the Supreme Court and our High Courts, even ordinary Indians, who will agree that allowing the good while banning the bad is a reasonable measure to contain riots and security threats across our country. In this simplicity is its seductiveness, is its appeal, as well as its danger. As I will show through evidence, as well as research, that limited internet shutdowns is a misnomer. They do not actually exist, and when they are enforced, they actually result in causing injury without any benefits. Limited internet shutdowns are not a novel idea. One of the earliest endorsements for it is found in the litigation before the Gujarat High Court in the case of Gaurav Bhai Suresh Vyas. In the 2015 decision of the High Court, it held that orders were proportional because they only prohibited wireless, mobile-based internet access rather than on phones. Now, restriction on access of medium, wired or wireless, while the most common, is one of the four primary methods to implement these limited internet shutdowns. In addition to it, there can be restrictions on time. For a certain number of days or hours, the internet is shut down. Or it can be to a geographical area, specific districts rather than the entire state. Or those used to block or whitelist specific websites or class of services, such as social media or internet banking. Something will be allowed, some corners of the internet will be shut down. All four of these methods for limited internet shutdowns in different variations have been implemented already by state governments in India. The first method of restricting internet-based access based on the medium of access, which may be wired or wireless, through a desktop or through a smartphone, is actually a form of socio-economic rationing. Think about it that only the affluent are able to afford laptops or wired-based access. And this is borne out from data by the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, TRAI, 
which states that wired access is only 3.8% of connections across right. India. So you are denying access to 96% connections in India. The second and the third methods for limited internet shutdowns are existing practices where orders are limited to a certain number of hours or days or specific areas. But from what we have seen, they keep on extending. The same orders are, in fact, cyclo style. The same reasons are there, which are always make this lack of specificity with only day and time being changed. Hence, the internet shutdown order, which was essentially made for, let's say, starting from a Monday to a Friday, is extended from that Friday to the next Wednesday. And from the next Wednesday, it goes to the next week. Or if the internet shutdown order is issued from Monday to Friday, then it is restored for a period of five to six days or even a month. And another internet shutdown order comes in three weeks or four weeks or six weeks. And even with respect to geography, it seems that it's fairly indiscriminate. It's not limited to one city, but stretches across entire states quite often. For instance, let's take the example of the state of Rajasthan, which does issue internet shutdown orders for a period of two to three days in specific cities. However, even these can be easily repeated and re-promulgated. As per a report which crunches the data from Human Rights Watch and IFF, between January 10th, 2020 and September 25th, 2021, there were 85 internet shutdown orders in the state, out of which 26 were for the city of Udaipur or 30 in the city of Jaipur. So imagine going without the internet if you're in Jaipur for a month. Now the final method is essentially of blocking one corner of the internet, specific services, such as banning VPNs or virtual private networks, social media, internet-based messaging, such as WhatsApp. And these are quite often called into question for contributing to rumor mongering, acts of violence, etc., etc. Now, the evidence for this is indeed weak. But first, let's look at how this is technically imposed or it is even possible. Now, for instance, as per a technical analysis by Pratik Vagre and Ruini Lakshane, for the whitelisting approach in Jammu and Kashmir, 80 out of the 153 permitted websites failed to load for meaningful use, which means that most of the websites just did not load and load it incompletely. This is because websites have common elements which do not only draw from one server as well as the websites would be serving the entire country of India at the very least. And hence, they'll be drawing elements within the web page that you see from different web services and web servers, and these will be blocked. And if they are blocked, if the page will load incompletely, the website will not be fully accessible. So you will not be able to do internet banking and your children will not be able to do remote education. Further, this whitelisting approach will also be discretionary. Companies and web services and applications will seem to be a part of this list, which will give the government more discretionary bar without any standards and safeguards in place. Another difficulty in the whitelisting or selectively banning applications is that they can be easily circumvented through VPNs or through other methods in which users will have some level of ingenuity if they have technical sophistication or even if they don't have it, they'll be able to manage it some way or the other. Now, this gives rise to another form of restriction by the state which will then rely on physical verification, which can be stop and frisk measures. We have already seen this happening in cities in Jammu and Kashmir when the whitelisting approach was in fact permitted there. As well as we've seen it even without internet shutdowns being done in cities such as Hyderabad which has cordon searches. So it essentially means a cop will check your smartphone to make sure you're only accessing 153 permitted websites rather than the entire internet. Now despite the widespread use of limited internet shutdowns or even internet shutdowns much more broadly with India attaining the number one rank there has been no study conducted till date by the government of India or by a state government whether they are actually effective. It is not ever asked itself the question that given the visible economic loss, the social loss, the deprivation of opportunity, entertainment, bonding, social, personal for people across this country, whether it actually works in preventing violence. And this has been noticed by the Standing Committee of ID, which in fact, published a report on internet shutdowns and it recommended to the Department of Telecom that please do conduct such a study. And then again, when the Department of Telecom did not conduct such a study based on its recommendations, in its 37th action taken report, noted in quotes, it was perplexed with the reply of the department and deplored its indifferent attitude. It strongly urged an assessment on, quote, the impact of the internet shutdown on the economy to find out its effectiveness in dealing with public emergencies and public safety, end of quote. Now, while there is no official study whether internet shutdowns work in their stated purpose, we have ample evidence that it causes social and economic harm. 
There's a qualitative study called of sieges and shutdowns in Manipur, which quotes an interview of a female protester regarding a gang rape which took place in 2017 and that led to, in quotes, one of the biggest rallies in Imphal. Here, the woman stated that I was part of the protest. The case is under trial now. Whatever information we got, we kept sharing and posting on Facebook, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. This essentially means that women use the internet as an effective medium towards assembly, organizing themselves and demanding state accountability in Manipur in 2017. And the state response was to shut down the internet. Hence, a limited internet shutdown which seeks to ban services such as Facebook, Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, in fact, will reduce the ability of citizens to hold the government to account. The second study I'd like to quote is a quantitative analysis by Jan Rastak who even suggests in quotes that violent mobilization seems to grow in intensity during blackouts, end of quote, as people lose the ability to peacefully protest. Many more studies exist, but we do not need to look beyond our newspapers. Each week, there is a report of Indians put to risk due to the forceful deprivation of the internet. At present, all four methods of limited internet shutdowns are undergoing institutional expansion. The Telecom Regulatory Authority of India is acting on a reference from the Department of Telecom, which started a public consultation on July 7th on over-the-top services. There are two parts to this consultation. The first part has been talked about very publicly, especially by startups regarding a revisiting of net neutrality. But another chapter of the same consultation is concerned with limited internet shutdowns. Here, comments which have come from most telecom operators, including Reliance, Jio, Bharti, Airtel and Vodafone, are in favor of limited internet shutdowns at the level of these online service providers such as YouTube, Facebook or WhatsApp, some have even suggested that orders need to be issued by state governments directly to Google and Facebook or other large social media platforms which then need to comply under the Telegraph Act and not provide these services in different districts or states where an internet shutdown is in place. Now, a challenge to internet shutdowns as I went over was also there in the Manipur High Court which also resorted to the doctrine of limited internet shutdowns and even the Standing Committee on IT, based on submissions by the Department of Telecom and the Supreme Court in the Anurara Basin judgment has condoned selective bans as much as its other recommendations are incredibly positive. So let us ask ourselves, when there is no evidence that internet shutdowns prevent violence, and on the contrary, there's adequate evidence and research which shows that indeed cause harm, why do we continue to place our faith in the curative powers of internet shutdowns? Can we continue to believe in the probabilistic notion that it may help save lives when ample data shows that prevents people from organizing not only for protests but also for their own safety and relief, undertaking an artificial balancing exercise just to seem reasonable while giving up our fundamental rights when the restriction is not efficacious, when the restriction is not born out of evidence, such as for limited internet shutdowns, is an act of blind failed policy making that camouflages unaccountable censorship bars which can place millions of Indians in certain danger. The third part of this video deals with the much more recent developments emerging from the state of Manipur regarding this issue. These recent developments are about how the internet was restored and then banned back again and why this poses very troubling questions for the rest of India. Now on September 23rd, 2023, the Chief Minister of Manipur, Biryan Singh, in a press conference cited improved law and order for the restoration of complete internet access across the state. This was accompanied by an order by the Home Department, which noted as per inputs from the Director General of Police that incidents of violence had, in quotes, comparatively lessened. It marked the end of the second longest internet shutdown in India, which began from May 3, 2023, stretching into more than 143 days. Now, reports of restoration and normalcy prompted optimism, especially for outstation students who sought to return to Manipur back to their families, or for relief workers in the camps who needed to raise donor aid. This improvement though was short-lived and it ended in three days. On Tuesday, Indian social media users woke up to the gruesome pictures of dead bodies of two mighty students. These barbaric images drew national outrage and mass protest in Imphal, which the state government did what it does best. It again shut down the internet. Now what explains this administrative response? I have argued and presented research just a few minutes ago that they do not work. Then is the state government of Manipur acting on blind dogma? What explains its continued confidence in imposing these blanket internet restrictions on mobile internet access? To answer these questions, we must first look at the striking similarities 
between the rapist and the previous national outrage. It bears repetition that on July 19, 2023, a video rape of sexual violence by a mob on two cookies of women came to national attention through social media. Here in both instances, the actual incidents of violence took place weeks before they came to wider public knowledge. The mighty students went missing around July 6, 2023 and the video of the cookies of women was made on May 3, 2023. However, it took weeks for it to come to national attention, coinciding with first the partial restoration of internet access and then with the complete lifting of the blanket internet shutdown. But what is truly depressing is the state response. The government announced publicly the criminal prosecutions only after mass outrage. All of this demonstrates both a lack of ability to offer policing and safety to the residents of Amaripur as well as a complete breakdown of civic trust not only between communities but between people and the state. Today there exists a growing lack of confidence in the Chief Minister's competence to deliver on the constitutional duties for which he is sworn into office. Given the extensive period of the continuing internet shutdown, it is fair to assert that it serves the interest of the government more than the citizens as it reduces the accountability and the demand citizens are making to the government. Such gain to the state government, while deeply cynical, comes with the possibility of little to no risk and which is why this internet shutdown continues. Now you may expect a check from the union government which also has the same political party in power which is in power in the state as well. However, this is completely absent. For the union government itself has set a disturbing precedent where it shut down the internet in Jammu and Kashmir for 552 days. This extensive internet shutdown gave rise to litigation. However, the central government has pursued its course doggedly in favor of internet shutdowns. It is refused to make a centralized repository of orders of internet shutdowns which would improve research and evidence questioning the practices of internet shutdowns. On the contrary, Last September, it published a proposed draft telecom bill which maintained the internet shutdown power without any safeguards or even the directions which are issued by the Supreme Court in the Anuradha Basin judgment. Any demands for accountability, even in public interactions with high functionaries of the union government, is dismissed. It is caricatured. Now, let us just take the most recent instance of a public interaction on this subject, which was done on September 26th and the Council for Foreign Relations by the External Affairs Minister. His response to India's democratic backsliding as evidenced by a phone in rank by indices such as Freedom House, which includes internet shutdowns, was to be dismissive. He stated in quotes that such reports have strong bias, distort facts, and are driven by ideological agendas. On a question for the conflict on Manipur, the External Affairs Minister maintained that the statement by the 13 special rapporteurs and six experts of the United Nations was presumptive and the reason for loss of life and livelihood in Manipur was due to quote-unquote tensions which have a long history. But does this take away from calls for accountability towards the chief minister and the state government? From all of this, we can reasonably assess that the union government rather than checking the state government encourages internet shutdowns. And the courts by themselves also are failing in their duties by resorting to willful blindness and not undertaking judicial review of the orders of internet shutdowns which have been passed. It is not as if we have seen the last videos of images of brutality coming from Manipur that make us question our own humanity. These posts will continue as they match an unresolved social conflict and breakdown of citizen trust which needs to be addressed by the leaders of India today. Our responses will numb with time. Apathy will build up again. But this tragedy will not stop by itself. Many people have used the term cycle of violence to describe the situation. This phrase as coined by Lenore Walker includes three stages. Firstly, tension. Second, battery. And third, a honeymoon phase that is suffered by survivors of domestic violence. While this theory is no longer in use for it was too simplistic and has gone through further development as well as criticism, it is an apt metaphor appropriately describing the abusive relationship between the state and the citizen. Those in power have been definitely deprived opportunities of health, employment and safety in a digital society to the masses to serve their own interests and avoid public accountability. The situation and the lack of accountability which has resulted from internet shutdowns till date serves as a warning that it will only grow. Limited internet shutdowns will go beyond Jammu and Kashmir and Manipur to many more states, cities, towns, districts and villages across India. On this very concerning note, let me end this video. But before I go, 
Let me also refer to those three op-eds which I have authored first in the Hindu and two pieces subsequently in the Indian Express which are the basis of this video. A lot of the information that I've shared with you is on the basis of research as well as reports which have emerged from Manipur from the people of Manipur. I have not commented consciously on the ethnic conflict given that I lack expertise on it. What I do hold expertise over are the effects of digitization on our civil liberties, on our fundamental right and our democratic polity. To end, I offer my condolences and prayers to the people of Manipur. While I can't begin to imagine the complexity and the challenges of what you're facing, please know that my thoughts are with you, which is also why I made this video. And I hope more people outside the state are able to view it and perceive the level of conflict and also offer support to people there.